I'm really excited to introduce Ted Bergman uh, to all of you on the day two of the Shark Week of Lacrosse, uh, which is the Lacrosse Virtual Summit. We had six uh, presentations yesterday, and we have seven today. Um, and uh, really excited to hear from Ted Bergman, who is uh, played his college lacrosse at Wesleyan, is now the assistant coach uh, for Dylan Sheridan at Cleveland State, and has a critical approach to goaltending. And I can't wait to hear about it. Ted, welcome aboard. Thanks. I'm really excited to be here. I think, I think that this um, lacrosse panel that you're putting together is pretty amazing. And as we briefly mentioned in our little discussion prior to this, it's gaining exposure all over the world, which I think is, is pretty awesome. Yeah, it really is, man. It's like, it, it's, it's amazing what the power of the internet can do, isn't it? it? It really is. All right. So whenever you're ready, why don't you, uh, why don't you take us through this? Yeah, I mean, I'd love to. All right. So I titled my presentation here, uh, A Critical Approach to Goaltending. And I'm really fortunate to have uh, studied at Wesleyan University, which is a, a liberal arts college in Middletown, Connecticut. And one of the biggest lessons that you learn when you study at a school like Wesleyan is it, it teaches you to ask questions. Um, so the big thing that I do in this presentation is I just ask questions to the traditional concepts that you teach goalies. And I, I question, why are you taught this way? Is there a better way to teach it and, and why? And I think the big question I ask is why. So everything that I'm going to break down for you here is a different approach to the goaltender position. It's an all encompass, all encompassing approach. I, I get after it all. Um, and before I get into it, I just want to thank um, Charlie Congleton, who was my goalie coach at Wesleyan University. He was an all American goalie himself. Uh, and he did a lot for my personal development as a player, uh, more importantly, as a man, but a lot of my philosophy that I use, uh, he helped uh, he helped develop, and I do use a lot of his stuff. So sh shout out to Coach Congleton. Uh, so I guess I'll just dive into it right away here. Yeah, let's do it. All right, so I first want to start with qualities that you have to have as a goaltender. Um, this can be from the youth level, or this could be all the way up to um, the Division One college level if you have a tough goalie battle. Um, these are the qualities – that I find are most important for goaltenders. First, they have to be competitive. And I think there's a misconception that all athletes are competitive, but I'm talking about like a higher level competitor. In basketball, you can think all basketball players are competitive, but Kobe Bryant is that higher level competitor. It's just that people who have that unique innate ability to compete. And I think that's incredibly important in the goal. And I'll get to uh, the reasons why when I get to more of the mental piece of the goaltending position. The second quality that you must have to play goalie is you have to be athletic. Uh, there's, a, there's a big problem in youth lacrosse where coaches like to put uh, the, some of their more unathletic guys in the goal. Uh, maybe the guy with the slowest speed on the team, the, the player who couldn't make it at attack, couldn't make it at midfield, couldn't make it at defense. So let's throw him in the goal and see if he can make it there. That's an approach to goaltending that I don't like. I think it undervalues uh, the clearing aspect of the game, uh, especially now that there's a shot clock in uh, Division I lacrosse. Uh, clearing the ball at a high percentage is incredibly important. And you need goalies who are athletic in order to clear the ball and to make athletic saves. So being athletic is incredibly important when you're playing goaltender, especially at the youth level. If you're at the youth level and you're looking for someone who might be a good goalie, try your fourth attackman. Try your fifth or sixth offensive midfielder. Kids with good hands who are athletic and who know how to play the game of lacrosse. Third, a quality that you must have is you have to be mentally tough. Uh, mental toughness is um, something that I take a lot of pride in as a man. It's something that I think is, can only be taught. Not only, but it's very well taught through sport, especially the goaltender position. And you need to be mentally tough. I played in the NESCAC, as we mentioned, at Wesleyan. And I'd be giving up 17, 18 goals a game. So if you get caught up in the negatives, you're going to get caught up for a lot of minutes there because you're getting scored on quite a bit. So being able to be mentally tough to overcome that adversity and to be disciplined enough mentally to only focus on the next shot, that next opportunity, uh, that's essential for, goal, for goaltenders. Uh, and then I have it in bold here because it's most important. Uh, you you got to be a gamer here. You, you just got to be a gamer. You got to love to play the sport of lacrosse. And why do you have to love to play the sport of lacrosse? Well, it, it really hurts 
to play goalie. Like getting hit with that ball really hurts. Um, and if you don't love to play the game, what's going to get you back in that goal when you just get pelted with a rock at 100 miles an hour? You've got to love to play the game. You've got to be a gamer. And I think that translates well to when the game's on the line in the fourth quarter, if it's 10-10, if it's overtime, you've got to be able to make that save. If you can't make the save when all the pressure is on, then you're not going to be able to succeed at the highest level. You've got to be a gamer to play the goalie position at the highest level. So I've developed what I call the TB8 method. Uh, TB, those are my initials, Ted Bergman. Uh, eight, that's the number that I wear. Uh, Jamie, I know you have a pretty special connection with the number three, I believe. Yeah. Uh, I, have a, I have a really special connection with the number eight. Um, so the way I like to think about it, some people think about it as an infinity sign, but the eight, it just never stops. It keeps moving. So you're going to have highs, you're going to have lows, but no matter where you are on that eight, it's just going to continue to go. So I like to think about it like a, it's a, it's a numerical representation of mental toughness, right? So no matter where you are on that eight, it, it doesn't matter because it's going to continue to move forward. So I like to think about the number eight like that, like a mental toughness representation. And it really helps me um, stay focused on, again, that, that next task, that next shot. So here's the TB8 method. It's my all-encompassing method, the goaltending. First, you have the mental piece of goaltending. Uh, mental piece of goaltending is uh, it's everything. It's absolutely everything. And you can teach the fundamentals. Uh, you can have a, a, a guy like Scotty Rogers who, who fills up the cage pretty well, but if you don't have the mental piece to goaltending, then you don't have anything in the crease. After mental, there's the physical piece to goaltending. Of course, we play a, a sport, a contact sport. So there's obviously a physical piece to it. You're moving your body, you're using your limbs and your hips. There's a lot of physical aspects to the position that I cover. And then finally, there's the technical piece to goaltending. How, how do you hold your hands? Where do you move your hands? And I, sure, this works for goaltending, but if you think about it, Jamie, this really works for, for sports in general. No matter what sport or what phase you're in, there's going to be a mental component to it, there's going to be a physical component to it, and there's going to be a technical component to it. I think this is a pretty clear way just, just to zoom out and to get the entire goaltender position into three words, the mental piece, the physical piece, and the technical piece. No doubt. And it's, and, and you got to keep going through them just like the eight keeps going in circles, you know, you got to keep coming back and revisiting and working. And so um, I love it. Absolutely. So what I'm going to do here for the rest of the presentation is I'm going to go through each of these. I'm going to go through the mental phase, the physical piece and the technical piece. I'm going to go through different exercises I use to train. I'm going to go through in game, out of game. I'm not going to miss anything for you. I'll hit it all. Love it. So let's start with the mental approach. This is uh, one of my favorite pictures um, that was taken uh, pregame. And it's just a good opportunity. Just It kind of shows, you know, that pregame meditative piece to goaltending that I find to be really important. You really are on an island in the crease. You're in your own space. And it's really important to get into your own headspace pri um, prior to getting into the goal. It'll allow you to play and compete at a higher level. So something that I've never really understood, this, this is the beginning to the critical approach to goaltending. When I think about how we train athletes, we're always training our hand-eye coordination. We're always training our footwork. But what are we not training? We're not training how to focus our mind. And especially when you play goalie, I like to think of it like a, like a seeker in Quidditch. You know, Harry Potter, he's focused on that golden snitch. That thing's pretty, pretty darn small and it's moving pretty fast. I like to think of goalies as the seeker. They're focused on a small ball that moves at about 100 miles an hour. So it doesn't matter how much you train your footwork and your hands. I'm not going to say it doesn't matter because that stuff is important. But why don't we train our minds to focus? So this is a system that I developed that, ha that helps to train your mind to focus. So I call this the numbered ball. And I do this with my goalies pre-game and pre-practice every day. So it's pretty simple here. It's literally just a lacrosse ball that in Sharpie you write numbers on. So you see the two, you see the three, the one, the eight, of course, can't miss it, the four. So how does the exercise work? Before the game, before practice, you can just find a wall. We use a door because it bounces well. You find a wall, you find a door, and you simply just throw the ball against the wall and you say the numbers that you see coming back at you. So you say one, eight, four, three. And as you continue to progress throughout the exercise, 
you'll notice that you end up seeing more numbers coming back at you. So by the end of the drill, you're seeing 813, 424, 53, 841, 637, etc. You're just training your mind to focus on the smallest detail of a lacrosse ball. So when the entire lacrosse ball is coming at you, your mind is already trained to focus on a smaller detail. The ball itself will appear bigger in your head. Therefore, it'll be easier to track and easier to save. This is a great exercise to get your mind focused prior to practice and especially prior to games. Here at Cleveland State, we practice at 6.30 in the morning. It's a unique mental challenge for our goalkeepers. So we have our goalies get there at about 6.15. They do this numbered ball for about five or six minutes. It just helps to wake up their mind. It gets their focus going so they're not lackadaisical when they do eventually get into the crease. I love that. It's really cool. Next thing that I do with the goalies here is I warm them up with striped balls. Again, nothing, nothing expensive, nothing fancy. You take a Sharpie and you draw circles on the ball. So I like to tell this story when I talk about the striped ball exercise. I, I'm from Philadelphia. I'm a proud, proud Philadelphia, Delaware County, Strathaven High School. And growing up, I was, a, I was a big Philadelphia sports fan. I still am. And I used to love watching the Philadelphia Phillies. And we had a legendary broadcaster. His name was Harry Callis. And he had some some of the best calls in Philadelphia sports. And our power hitter at the time was Ryan Howard. He was a big left-handed first baseman. And I mean, Ryan Howard could absolutely crush baseballs. He would hit them so far into the stands. You'd, it was unbelievable. And often Harry Callis would comment, wow, Ryan, Ryan Howard really saw the stripes on that one. And what he was referencing was that baseballs have two red stripes and hitters when they're hitting at the highest level can actually see the revolutions of those stripes. They see the stripes coming at them. That's how they know they're focused. And then they crush the baseball out of the park. So critically, I thought to myself, huh, why don't we have goalies see the stripes of a lacrosse ball? It was just another way to get them to focus on the smallest detail of the ball in order to train their mind to focus more. So I warm up my goalies with stripe balls here. We got black stripes, we got red stripes. And when I shoot at the goalies, I just ask them, not verbally, they don't have to tell me, just inside their own head, what color was that ball? Was that a red stripe? Was that a black stripe? And it's just a way for them to check themselves how focused are they. When you're not focused, you don't see them at all. The ball's moving fast. You just see a ball coming at you. When you get to that higher level of focus, and again, once you're pre-game into a competitive moment, you'll literally see three stripes spinning at you as they're coming at you. This is just a great exercise to train your mind to focus before you hop in the cage. My critical approach here, we always train our bodies in the weight room. We're always training our footwork on the ladder. Goalies, why aren't we training our focus? That is an essential piece to the puzzle in the crease. You got to train your mental, your mental focus. These are great exercises to help do that. I mean, honestly, is there anything more important than being able to see the ball and focus on that. I mean, seriously. No, if you have to be able to see the ball. But I think what's more important, Jamie, is being able to just focus on one thing and to cancel out all of the noise. You know, when you play at the, when you play at the college level, you're going to have opposing fans. You're going to have, uh, you know, you're going to have the sidelines. You're going to have the coaching staff. You're going to have weather. You're going to have injuries. You're going to have all this noise going around you. And the question for me is, are you able to focus on the smallest detail of a lacrosse ball when all of that noise is going on? That's the challenge. That's the mental toughness piece that I'll touch on at length later in this presentation. But just these exercises to help you focus and help you stay in the moment and focus on small details that I think is essential to the goaltender position. So I'll continue here with the in-game mental approach. We went over what to do pregame, but how does that mental toughness piece, again, I love that buzzword, but I, it's essential. How does this mental piece translate to the in game? So I mentioned that at Westland, I got scored on a, a whole bunch of times. So another critical approach to goaltending, I practice making saves. I, do, I make saves at about 50% of the time. So, Jamie, I have a question for you. If I make saves at 50% of the time, what happens the other 50% of the time? Other 50% other fifty either goes in or misses the net. Yeah, so a save percentage is strictly on what goes in and what is saved. 
So the other 50% of the time, the ball is going into the net. So if I'm going to practice making saves, which I do about 50% of the time, I probably should practice taking the ball out of the net at about because I do that just as much as I make saves. So here I train my goalies to take the ball out of the net. But I don't just teach them to take the ball out of the net lackadaisically. I teach them to do it the same way every single time. So what does this allow? It allows you as the goaltender to refocus. It's the same approach every time. So it's a, I call it a mental reset. So I'll walk you through it. I have a video here. Of course, my goalies would never get scored on this easily, but we let one by here off hip. You inhale. The first step is you inhale. You then take the ball and you feel it in your hand as our goalie is doing right here. Notice that he's feeling the ball. When you feel the ball, you exhale. This allows you to mentally reset. You inhale. You focus on the smallest detail of the ball, similar to the pregame exercises. You, sm you focus on the smallest detail of the ball in your hand. And then the final step is you walk over to the referee, you hand it to him, and you say two words, thank you. Why do you say thank you? Number one, do you know how mentally challenging it is to go over, inhale, exhale, hand the ball to the referee, and say thank you when there's three minutes left in the fourth quarter and your team is down by one goal? That is a mentally challenging exercise. And if you're able to compose yourself to do such a minute task as to say thank you to a referee, then I trust that you're mentally tough enough to focus on the next save. The second thing that I think is really important here that people too often forget, parents especially too often forget, is that referees are human beings too. So to just forget the fact that referees are humans, it's, it's foolish saying thank you to a referee it just calmly lets them know that you appreciate the job they're doing. You understand that they're a human and that they play a critical role in a lacrosse game. And if you say thank you to a referee enough times, if there's a close race to the end line and a goalie's diving for that end line, I bet you he might think about giving you that ball just because you showed him some respect when he came to get the ball out of the net. So say thank you to the referee because treat him like the official that he is. But most importantly, inhale, feel the ball, exhale, and use this time as getting scored on as a mental reset for you so that when you come back from this and you give the ball to the referee and you're done, you're back in the goal and you're already focused on the next play. I think this piece, I've never seen it taught before. I think it's really important to teach goalies um, to be mentally disciplined. Oftentimes you see goalies fall on their knees. They'll swat the ball out of the net. They'll, they'll start slashing their arms. They'll slash the posts. They're laying. They'll throw the ball to the referee. You'll hear curse words. I don't like that. That's not mentally disciplined for my taste. I want to see a goalie have the composure to inhale, feel the ball, exhale, hand it to the referee, say thank you, and then focus on the next shot. Really smart. I love it. So that's sort of the mental approach to goaltending. Mental toughness, I'll touch on. That's its own issue. We'll get there. Uh, but that's the pregame mental approach, and that's the in-game uh, mental approach, taking the ball out of the net. So now it's on to the next phase, uh, the physical approach. So the, uh, the physical approach to goaltending, again, it's, it's pregame, um, and it's pretty much uh, off-season or off the field. In-game, there, there is no true physical approach. I, this is more about what muscles, what, what muscle groups do I think are essential to the goaltender position, and how do we train them? Goaltending is all about your hips. I can't say this enough. Goaltending is all about your hips. I would like to extrapolate on this a bit and say all of lacrosse is all about your hips, uh, but I'm not far along in my coaching career to, uh, career to be making those types of claims yet. Uh, I am far enough in my career to tell you that goaltending is all about your hips. So when you explode and you're in the position, your hips are like this, and you make saves, and they pop up, they close, they pop up, they close, they pop up. It's all about those quick twitch, hip explosive muscles. Also, you spend the majority of your time in a pretty, pretty significant squat there. So your hips are always engaged. So what do I like to do with my goalies? They have to stretch their hips. 
So these are the pregame exercises that we do to stretch our hips. I like to do all these exercises for about 10 reps here. My goalie is just doing them for one rep just to show you some of the exercises. Again, these exercises aren't specific. It's not these exercises or nothing. It's just trying to show you different ways that you can stretch your hips because your hips are essential muscles. This brings it back to the critical approach to goaltending. When you do warm-ups for team lacrosse, you get in your lines, you jog, you stretch your hamstring, you stretch your calf, you know, you'll do your, uh, your military kicks straight in the air, you'll touch the ground, you'll do your side shuffles. But how many times, Jamie, when you see lacrosse teams warm up, do you see them train and stretch their hips? Very, very rarely do you see teams stretch their hips and engage their core. These are muscles that are just absolutely essential to the sport of lacrosse, especially the goaltending position. Here we see our goalie stretching his IT band. That's a part of your exterior hip. Again, I don't see many teams laying on the field doing this exercise pregame. I think it's essential to be able to stretch your hips pregame. This is a really important one here. This is a hip strengthener. So this is really tough. The first time you try to sit down and do this, you won't be able to. Our goalies, the first week of preseason – in the fall, they couldn't even lift their leg off the ground. Now you can see the, the amount of strength and flexibility they have to lift that leg straight up into the air. These are hip exercises that are undervalued and underappreciated. Strengthening your hips, these small muscles in your hips, allows you to be more explosive when you get to the ball. This is a great exercise, Jamie. This is just a roll back into a V. And what's the focus? It's on perfect balance. It's on perfect balance. Notice this isn't a speed exercise. My goalie is taking his time. His weight is perfectly distributed. It's even between both sides of his body, and he comes up, engages his core. It's a great balance exercise, hips and balance. These are so essential to the goaltending position. And then we finish with fire hydrants again. So this just stresses the importance of hip mobility, hip flexibility, and hip strength to the goaltender position. Being able to train this, and to exercise this before you practice, before you play, I think is essential to be able to compete at a higher level. What else does this opportunity do? Similar to the pregame numbered ball, where you're focused on the smallest detail of the ball, these exercises allow your mind to focus on the smallest detail of your body. Being in touch with your body is incredibly important as an athlete. We all know that. But how do you train that focus? When you're laying down and doing your hip exercises, don't listen to the rest of the team going through stick skill lines. Don't listen to the music that's playing. Don't listen to the fans chirping you from the sidelines. Just use all of your focus on that one singular muscle that you should be moving. And once you train with the numbered ball, and then you lay down and you train your mind with the hip exercises and you really focus on that specific muscle to get into the cage and focus on that small detail of the striped ball, by the time the game officially comes around, you're ready to go because you're so calm and you're so focused. There's nothing that can distract you. So what are some other exercises that we can use to, and this is more in the weight room, what are some exercises that we can use to train those hip explosive muscles? I like lightweight hang cleans. Notice the words lightweight. I don't need goalies going in there and throwing 225 on and trying to get a great power clean in to impress their friends. If 225 is light for you, that's okay. It's not the number I'm worried about. It's just the idea that I want it to be lightweight. So I'm not a strength coach by trade, so I can't necessarily comment on the form because I'm not um, officially allowed to do that, but I do want to comment on one thing. Look at the rep here, how the rep starts at the bottom and there's a pause. There's the pause. And that just signifies like a shot, right? You're going to reset your form every time. So when you're doing lightweight cleans, reset at the bottom and get your form down. Reset at the bottom and get your form down. You don't just want to be flying through the exercise where you're using that spring action in your hips. You want to stop and then reset and explode again. It, it simulates the explosiveness of a save. Another great one is box jumps but I like to do my box jumps a little bit differently. So as you'll see here, the box jumps occur, but watch the, watch the land here. The landing is on one leg as opposed to just a standard box jump with two legs. So what does that do? That strengthens those muscles in your ankle, those outer muscles in your ankle. 
It strengthens those muscles in the outside of your knee. And those are what I like to call the balance muscles. So balance is so important in the goal. You saw me stress that with the, with the roll, the roll backs to the V, the importance of balance. These are the balance muscles in the goal, your ankles and your knees. And if you think about the importance of balance, it occurs mostly on turns. So when the goalie is facing at X and he's forced to turn up field because of a pass, if there's a dodge and the goalie is forced to turn his body and to step, balance is essential. Anytime you're, you're maneuvering your body where you're turning or you're stepping, you have to reset with calm, clean balance. And these are exercises that help us strengthen our balance muscles, the ankles and the knees. Of course, we're working on our hip explosion as well with the nature of the box jumps. But by adding the varied single leg finish, it just parlays the balance muscles into that. You have any questions? That's pretty much the end of the physical piece there. Yeah, let me, um, let me field a couple questions here. So uh, one from Mark Prey, would you consider it bad taste or mentally, or mentally weak to just leave the ball in the net for the referee to pick it up and just go straight out to talk to the defense? Um, I wouldn't necessarily call that mentally weak. However, I think you undervalue the experience of inhaling feeling the ball in your hand, and then exhaling. I really find that experience to be meaningful because if you're running straight from the crease to go talk to your defense, you haven't had enough time to get your emotions in check. You're going to be on a, on a huge emotional high or low trying to correct what was just happening. The goalie has to be the calm presence on a defense. It doesn't mean he can't get after guys, but he has to be a calm presence. So I think it's really important for that goalie to take time for himself first gather himself, and then go talk to his defense. I also do think it's important to have an interaction with the referee. It's not their job to walk into the crease. You need to own that crease. That is your crease. You don't want any attack winner, or any referee walking into there. That is your crease. So take pride in your crease. Take pride in your goal. And I, I, I do value the, the emotion of taking the ball out of the net. It's really good stuff, Ted, all of it. Um, the, the, uh, the hips, I mean, everybody knows that flexibility is incredibly important, especially hip flexibility. Not many people are disciplined enough to work on it all the time. Um, and that includes, you were right when you said it's true for all, all positions. Um, and as far as the stability and balance that you gain from one-legged stuff is uh, phenomenal also. Um, yeah, so now it's time to talk about my favorite portion of my presentation, and that's the importance of yoga and why all goalies should be doing yoga. So, sure, yoga works on your hip flexibility. As you just mentioned, we all know the importance of hip flexibility. First and foremost, yoga works on your flexibility because it forces your body to stretch in pretty unique directions in which it hasn't done too often. So for that, first and foremost, yoga is important. What does it also do? It teaches you to focus on your breath. So the next two points go hand in hand. Focus on your breath and mental toughness training are the same exact thing. So I like to tell my goalies that throughout the course of the game, they're only allowed to have two thoughts. You're either 100% focused on the ball or you're 100% focused on your breath moving through your nose. If you're only focused on your breath, that means you're not focused on anything else. You're not focused on the scoreboard. You're not focused on the opposing team's bench. You're not focused on your girlfriend in the stands. You're not focused on your grandparents who are there watching you. You're not focused on the police car that just drove by behind you on the field. You're not focused on anything. You're either focused on the ball or you're focused on your breath. That keeps you mentally engaged and it keeps you focused on that next shot, that next opportunity. Too often, goalies get sidetracked. I like to call it rattled. Goalies get rattled because their thought process goes all over the place. That's okay. Your thought process is allowed to go all over the place. We're human beings. We can't control what thoughts come into our mind. But we can control as humans what we do with those thoughts once they enter our mind. So uh, we all have ears. I have ears. If I'm playing goalie and I hear an ambulance go by the field, it's not, I didn't hear that. I'm focused. It's okay. I heard the ambulance, it exists. I'm going to choose to forget about that thought and I'm going to refocus on my breath. It's just having the mental discipline to accept the thoughts that come into your mind and then to release them and to bring your focus back to your breath, which is something that you can control. I want to reiterate this. You can't control the thoughts that come into your mind, 
but you can control your response to those thoughts. And if your response to those thoughts is to say, okay, I'll get rid of that and I'll focus on my breath. To me, that's what mental toughness is. And these are all lessons that I've learned through yoga. I think they're essential. And I think goalies can learn this additional mental toughness piece through yoga. It just helps them focus on their breath to get rid of all of the mental distractions that we face. And again, if, if you get way more flexible because of it too, that doesn't hurt anybody either. So that's just my plug for, for yoga. Love it. All right, so now we get to the technical, the technical approach. And this is, this is uh, another critical approach to goaltending because my technique that I teach and that I play with, is, it's significantly different than the fundamentals that you hear throughout the, throughout the country and the world, for that matter, on how to best play the goalie position. So when you traditionally um, hear goalies or hear goalie coaches teach goalies how to save the ball, how often do you hear, get your top hand to the ball? Is that something you've heard before? Yes. Get your top hand to the ball. Get your top hand to the ball. Drive your top hand to the ball. When you see goalies do exercises with no stick, they'll only move their top hand to the ball. Move your top hand to the ball. Well, I thought about this critically. I learned to ask questions. Why are we taught this? Does it make sense? Is there a better way to teach it? And why? So this is the piece of the goaltending technique that coach Charlie Congleton had a big impact on because this was part of the technique that he taught and I've taken this and we together have implemented this bottom hand technique so instead of driving your top hand to the ball I teach boys to drive your bottom hand use your bottom hand to guide the stick so if you look at this picture here this is against Tufts one of our big rivals for Wesleyan you'll notice that sure my top hand is going to the ball it has to that's where the head of the stick is your top hand is always going to end up at the ball. That's, that's where you catch it. But what I want you to focus is look at the motion of my bottom hand. This is not a traditional windshield wiper save where just your top hand is going to the ball. It's not my top hand that's going to the ball. It's my bottom hand that's driving the stick. So it's not this motion. It's the bottom hand that's actually driving the stick to the ball. And I think this picture is a great visual representation of that. So let's get into this a little bit more. This is called the bottom hand technique. So you grip the stick with your bottom hand a little bit tighter and your top hand is a little bit looser. So what does having a looser top hand do for you? Well, it really cuts down on your rebounds, rebound prevention with a looser grip because there's not a great impact to your top hand and the ball. It's very loose and it kind of, it gives that natural give to making saves, having a loose top hand. Your bottom hand is what drives the stick to the ball. So what does that allow? And we'll certainly dive into this at length in a few slides. This keeps your hips always square upfield, which is essential because that's when you're most athletic. That's when your hips are most explosive is when they're facing the shooter and they're straight upfield. Oftentimes on that offside hip save, you're here to make that offside hip with the top hand. You open up your hips. You see how to get to my top hand here? I have to open up my hips. My hips are now facing the sidelines. I want my hips always facing upfield, so I use my bottom hand to drive me to the ball, which keeps my shoulders and my hips upfield. A good indicator to teach this with is always finish with a horizontal stick. Too often, goalies finish with a, with a vertical stick. Here, over here, notice that again, my hips are open, which is not good, especially down low. Goalies finish with a vertical stick. I teach to finish with a horizontal stick, and we'll get into why here as I get into some of my slides. So let's start with just that, that standard stick side high. The standard stick side high save. Notice how our goalie here, his hands are driving to the ball, but it's not just the typical you're here and your top hand makes the save. The goalie's feet are engaged and it is his bottom hand, his bottom hand that is driving his hands to the ball again jamie i want to reiterate your top hand is going to get to the ball that is how you make saves the head of the stick is at your top hand so naturally your top hand is still going to get to the ball what i'm trying to say is use your bottom hand to guide you use your bottom hand to drive that stick to the ball 
It'll always keep your hands in front of you. It'll make your feet come with you because you can't, you can just move your top hand without moving your feet. But if you want to move your bottom hand, you're going to have to move your feet to get it to come with you. So again, let's watch this save again. Just very simple. Top hand goes, but it's really your bottom hand that's driving your stick. Look at the horizontal finish. Great fundamentals from our goalie here. Ted, I love this. Um, to be honest with you, um, you know, I've always wondered why everyone isolates it to just top hand because in, in everything else, it's always a push and a pull. You know, I mean, like, you know, it's never just one, you know, and, and I'm a lefty who's right-handed. So everything I do is kind of guided by my, my bottom hand because it, const it controls the stick as a whole. Um, so, um, and when I tried to train myself to be a better right-handed lacrosse player as an attackman, I was like, well, how come I really struggle to catch a tough ball righty, but I can do it lefty? And I realized that if I just gripped my bottom hand real tight and kept my top hand real loose, that I could move my stick as a whole, and then I could make that tough offside handle that I just never could make. I mean, this is like something I've you know, figured out like in my mid-20s when I was trying to become a better lacrosse player. But um, I, think it's, uh, I think it's brilliant, you know, um, and it gives you more range. Um, so uh, keep going. I love it. Yeah, it's awesome. I love what you just said about the push-pull motion because that is exactly what I'm about to dive into here with the off-stick high save. Again, your bottom hand drives the stick. So look at, look at our goalie here with the off-stick high save. Notice his bottom hand. His bottom hand is moving here, and the stick finishes horizontally. It's the push and the pull. It's the push and the pull. I guess it's the pull and the push here. The it's that motion. So if yeah. you're using a top hand here, you're only using one arm. Your only muscles are engaged are your, your right shoulder, your right tricep, and that's what's pushing you to the ball. When you use your bottom hand, you're using both arms. You're using the triceps and the shoulders for both muscles. So it's just a quicker reflex. Instead of just using one hand to get across, you're using two hands to get across. And again, a critical approach. Why? Why do we do this? Because we're using both of our muscles. Our reaction time is quicker to the ball, which means we'll make saves at a higher percentage. It's quicker. Our hips are always upfield. And because we finish with the horizontal stick with a looser top hand, we're going to give up left rebound, less rebounds because we're driving through the ball. So let's watch this save again in full speed. Bottom hand drives the stick across the face. Again, your top hand is still going to get there. You're going to catch the ball, but use your bottom hand to drive you there. It's quicker. Both of your arms are involved. It's explosive, and your hips are always upfield. So let's go to the stick side hip. The stick side hip is where I like to teach the bottom hand technique first and foremost, just because it's the easiest save in lacrosse, and it's so easy to get lazy with your fundamentals here. Because when it's stick side hip, it's so easy to just drop your top hand and catch the ball and move on. But I want to see that bottom hand drive horizontally to the ball. And this is great fundamentals from the goalie here to show you exactly what we're looking for. Let's get that again. Notice the, notice the distance that the bottom hand has moved. It starts here. And look where it finishes. It is almost at the pipe. He started in the center of the goal, and that bottom hand is finishing all the way at the pipe. So what does that force? It forces your feet to move with you, which is so important. And notice our goalie's hips. They're straight up field. This is how I like to teach the bottom hand technique is just with stick side hip, just because it really teaches to harp on the fundamentals. Don't just move your top hand. Move your bottom hand. Let your bottom hand drive the stick to the ball. Your feet will follow. It's fundamentally sound. Any questions as I continue here? Uh, yeah, I think there are. Let's see. Um, let's see here. Is it also a translation and rotation thing? Top hand moves towards the ball is sort of a fulcrum point while the bottom hand rotates the stick. So the, the only issue with that is that focuses all of the, the forward momentum to the ball on your top hand because the fulcrum point would mean it would just rotate like this. Yeah. I'm looking to get my hands out away from my body. I'm going to be punching at the ball, explosive to the ball. So 
we're not keeping on the same plane here and where the focal point would make sense. We're looking to explode towards the ball, driving our, our bottom hands to the ball. So that would be my response to that question. Yeah, and, and, it's, and it's, this is consistent. You know, everything you're talking about is consistent with the realities of, the, of, of lacrosse in general. I mean, we just talked about the push and the pull, but and the idea of fulcrum. For a right-handed player that generates all their power as if they were throwing a baseball, their stick is longer. They could throw it really hard, but it's a slower release, whereas if you were to be a right-handed player playing lefty and you were to yank your bottom hand and push and pull, the fulcrum becomes your top hand, and therefore it's a shorter swing and it's quicker. And it's, it translates to catching as well as throwing. Um, yeah, again, and it's just, it just goes back to the initial point of the critical approach to goaltending. Ask questions. Ask the tough questions. Why am I taught this way? Is there a better way? Why? And that why is the big question for me. So let's go to the offside hip. This is the hardest save to make for, um, for all of goalies. And the, the bottom hand technique for the off hip save is, is tremendously important. Because as I referenced earlier, this is the save where goalies love to open up their hips to the sideline and it crushes their fundamentals. Goalies are most explosive and most athletic when their hips are facing upfield. And they also get locked up because they twist back and their butt end goes back. I'm looking for the butt end to go out and down. So when you're here off hip, the butt end goes out and down. As you'll see here with the goalie, the hips are always upfield. I have this a couple times. Out and down, the hips are always upfield. Let's watch this again. He's in his stance off hip, bottom hand's out and down. Notice how his hips are always upfield. His bottom hand is driving to the ball. It's not going up and backwards. It's going out and it's going down. This keeps the hips square up field. It releases the arms so that the bottom hand isn't getting caught behind you. And what else does it do? Let me get a pause for you right there. If this ball misses the stick, what's it going to hit? It's going to hit the goaltender's body. His body is behind the ball. If you're saving the ball like this and you open up and you miss, it's going in the back of the net. There's nothing behind it. So again, it's not, it's not consistent with the fundamentals of goaltending to go with your top hand to the ball offside hip. Your hips open up, number one. And number two, your body isn't behind the ball, which is something that you teach all goalies at the fourth and fifth grade level. Why don't we teach it at the college level? Your body should always be behind the ball. This bottom hand technique helps to eliminate some of those flaws. And essentially gives you more range. Absolutely gives you more range. This is a, I get a lot, of, a lot of bite back on this from different uh, kids and players I've coached in the past. However, every, I promise you, every single one of them, once they get reps in it, won't go back to going the old method with the top hand because you have so much more range and so much more freedom with your hands and your hips are more explosive. It is easier to make saves to the offside hip when you use this technique. Why? Because it makes sense. Your hands are in front of you. You're not getting caught up. You're keeping your body to the most explosive position that it can be in. And once you rep it enough times and you get used to the new technique, goalies do love it. And it translates to great saves on the field. And by the way, why do you think lefty goalies are generally incredibly quick to their offside? Because they're usually right-handed guys. That's why. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So low. Again, when you're making a save, it's the head of the stick that makes that save. I understand that. But I want to use the bottom hand to drive the stick to the ball. So when we're low, I like to finish with the horizontal stick. Often goalies finish with the stick vertically, up and down on low shots. But that doesn't use the full surface area of the goaltender's head. This is another critical thought. It's a question here. Why would you hold the goalie's stick vertically and minimize the surface area of the goaltender's stick? If you keep the goaltender stick horizontally on the ground, you maximize its surface area. It gives you a larger percentage to make a save because there's simply more room from a left to right dimension for you to make the save. Again, you, you lose a little bit on the, the vertical dimension, but your body is behind you to make up for that error. Putting the stick horizontally on the ground maximizes its surface area. Also, if you drive both hands to the ground, it's quicker than if you just drive your top hand to the ground. Again, using both of your arms to push something is going to be easier than using just one of your arms to push something. So let's watch this 
top hand, this bottom hand save, stick side low. Let's get that again so it loads. Boom. Notice the goalie with his bottom hand driving to the ball. The bottom hand drives a stick. It's horizontal. It gets all the way to the ground. And then look at the offside low. Same thing. All the way down. His bottom hand drives the stick. Let me try to get a good pause for you here. Boom. That's what I'm looking for right there. Bottom hand drives the stick to the ball. Stick is horizontal on the ground, maximizing its surface area. And our chest is directly over the ball. So any bounce is collected by our body. This is perfect form. It traps all the rebounds because your momentum is pushing the stick and the ball straight into the ground. And this is perfect form for a low shot. Oftentimes you'll see goalies look for a vertical stick here. They'll have their butt end pointed out towards the shooter. The head of the stick is down. That minimizes the stick's surface area. I want to maximize the head of the stick, the goalie stick. I believe that this bottom hand approach, getting your chest over the ball, having your stick on the ground, I believe this is the most effective and quickest way to stop the ball because you're using both of your hands to drive the stick into the ground. And this is how we approach low shots. Well, by the way, I mean, it's, it's clearly got to be quicker to go from a ready position to that position than to try to get your left hand all the way up in the air. <clears throat> I mean, it's just quicker to get there. It's a shorter movement. That is, that is correct. Uh, question here. So thoughts on goalies dropping to their knees and how does using the bottom hand more affect that? So, so basically, your thoughts on dropping your knees and would using your bottom hand technique have an impact on whether you like that or don't or either way? So I believe that there is a, a big distinction to make here, Jamie, about dropping to your knees and dropping to more of a split. Dropping to, dropping to your knees, I do not endorse ever because why? It minimizes your human being surface area. It makes you smaller. Because you're just taking your body and cutting off your legs and then putting you on the ground. That is making you a smaller person. So I don't support falling to your knees. Going to the, the splits, as they call it, I don't necessarily mind it all the time. But only use it when you literally have to. So what is the benefit of going into the, the splits, as they call it? If it's really, if you're struggling to get to the low shot, stick side low, you use gravity to help you get there. So you use the force of gravity, which drives your body and stick to the ground. So it makes you get there a little bit quicker just because you have the added, I believe it's negative 9.8, some unit. Uh, it helps you get there, which uses the force of gravity. Um, but in general, I like my goalies to step to the ball, get their chest over it and drive their bottom hand. Never fall to your knees. If you have to flop, okay. A lot, of, a lot of goalies play butterfly in hockey. I, it's, it's a hockey goalie and lacrosse goalie are sort of similar. So if you have to go to the, the flop, so be it. But let's try to be athletic enough, as I said in slide number one, let's try to be athletic enough that we can just rely on our hip, explos hip explosiveness and our footwork to get to the ball. Well, you, it seems like with a flop, you know, when, when it happens, it's because you're really, you know, at a major disadvantage as a goalie. And, Sometimes if you don't do that, it's going to go in. You're just not, not going to have time to react because of the distance. And, but it seems like it's consistent with like the posture that you see right here, that if the guy's leg kept going wide, his hands were driving down in the same fashion, that it might be quicker to get there, you know, with a split. And it seems consistent with what you're talking about with your stick positioning and, and really, you know, almost everything. It's just, it, it's just a little bit of a guess because, you know, it's like a breakaway and you have to. Yeah. It's an, it's an all or nothing move. It's, it's an all or nothing move. I would definitely never go to the splits on like a, an outside step down shot if you don't have to. But if it's an inside one on one, you, you know, the ball is going low to the pipe and you're trying to throw your body at it to keep it out of the net. So be it. But just know it's all or nothing. Like if they fake and you're down there, you're not touching it. Uh, another question on bounce shots. Goalies have been taught to smother the ball by punching the bottom hand away from themselves and creating a tent for the ball to bounce up into. Thoughts on that? Again, my question number one is why? Why were they taught that? Does it make sense? So when you're making the tent, the angle of your stick is, is like this. So what does that do to the surface area of the goalie's head? It makes it smaller. It makes it smaller. So I understand the idea of punching the bottom hand over the top to smother the ball. In this bottom hand approach, I sort of am doing a similar thing from a teaching perspective. I'm encouraging my goalies to use their bottom hand to drive the ball into the ground 
but how do I feel about the vertical stick tense? I don't like it from the simple reason that number one, it takes you longer, as we mentioned, to get your stick in a vertical position as opposed to a horizontal position. And number two, it loses the surface area of the stick. I also think that this term bounce shot uh, needs to be a little bit more specific because to save a ball in that tent fashion, it would actually have to be a low shot that doesn't bounce because if a shot were to, if a shot were to bounce that close to your feet, you would save it as a low shot. A bounce shot is a shot that bounces off of the ground and changes height and trajectory once it's off the ground to the point where you're saving it uh, as if it were a shot in the air. So a bounce shot to your offside hip, you use the same fundamentals as you were an offside hip shot in the air. A shot off stick low is different than a shot that's an off stick hip bounce shot. And it's tough to clarify, but I do think there's an important distinction there. Really smart stuff. And the last one is, uh, so from Patrick, is, is it also a translation uh, and rotation thing? Top hand moves towards the ball and is sort of a fulcrum point while the bottom hand rotates the stick. I think that is it, right? Is that yeah. What uh, to be completely honest with you, I'm struggling with the definition of a fulcrum point, so I don't want to give the, an incorrect answer because I don't understand the scientific backing of the term. Right. Uh, so well, I, I basically, think, you know, your top hand is pivoting the stick, your bottom hand is moving it, and therefore it's, it, it creates a little bit more quickness. Whereas if your correct. top hand is doing all the work, then your bottom hand is the pivot point, and it moves with a bigger – That is correct. I want your bottom hand doing all the work, and your top hand is pivoting and rotating. Yeah. All right, good. Keep it going. Good stuff. All right, so now I get to my favorite part of the presentation, uh, and that's mental toughness. So, again, technique is important. Uh, I, I harp on the bottom hand technique, and I love to think about it from a critical perspective and ask questions. Why? Why does this make sense? Is this quicker? But at the end of the day, Jamie, if, as long as you keep the ball out of the net, it doesn't really matter how you did. Um, what's most important to me is mental toughness. Um, so I love to use this picture to talk about mental toughness. This was a, this was a picture from the NESCAC championship game. Uh, it's a, the NESCAC is a very competitive conference in Division III. Um, and this was the championship game. It was our first time being in the championship game in quite some time. Um, it was against Middlebury, who is a, who's a powerhouse in Division III. And I like to look at the scoreboard here and sort of break it down for people. It's 8-8 eight to eight in the fourth quarter with 8 minutes and 48 seconds left in the game. What does that score indicate? That we're going to need a stop. At some point, we're going to have to make a save because it's a tie game in the conference championship game in the fourth quarter. You're going to have to make a save. What does this scoreboard not indicate? This scoreboard doesn't show you that I got scored on from 16 yards on a bounce shot. This scoreboard does not show you that I threw the ball out of bounds on a clear. This scoreboard does not show you that I got scored on twice from the same player on the same shot that I probably should have saved both times. All of that stuff is in the past. It is completely irrelevant to this moment that is happening right here, right now. And that's what mental toughness is. It's being able to disregard everything that has happened previously, to focus just on your breath, just on the ball, and be able to make the next save because that is all that matters is the next save goalies need to be mentally tough i don't want to see any emotion after you get scored on don't slam your stick don't curse out your defenders how about this pick up the ball take a deep breath hand it to the referee and say thank you and then approach the next shot that's mental toughness so i like to move from this picture eight eight with nine minutes to go left in the game to this picture nine eight with zero minutes left in the game. You can see I'm in a full embrace with uh, my co-captain and best friend Quinn Mendelson on the side there. We had a shutout in the entire fourth quarter. We made, four, we made four big stops as a defensive unit, and you need to be mentally tough in order to make those types of plays. Again, you have to be a gamer. When all of the pressure is on, when all the pressure is on, the brightest lights are shining, can you make a play? Can you be mentally tough enough to forget about everything that has happened prior and to just focus on that next shot. Mental toughness is so important for goalies, but I'm going to take it way farther than that, Jamie. Mental toughness is so important for life. You can't control all of the events that happen in your life, but you can control what you do with them when they do. 
having the ability to be mentally tough enough to disregard the noise, to simply focus on your breath and be ready to attack the next, the next task at hand with full mental clarity, I think is a, it's a really invaluable skill for, for handling this journey of life. Um, it's been really helpful for me as I've navigated the ups and downs of being a, um, a, a young coach in my young 20s. And I really do credit the position of goalie uh, for helping to teach me these skills of being mentally tough and being able to stay positive, to overcome adversity, and to always have my focus on that next opportunity because I don't care what's happened in the past. Right now, I'm focused on my breath. And whatever comes at me next, I'll be fully focused on it. Um, so that's sort of my spiel here. Uh, just time for questions. And a quick plug, follow us on Instagram, CSU Vikings Lax. Give us a follow. We're doing pretty big things in the marketing department here in Cleveland. Speaking of which, I can't wait to come visit you guys. So I'm going to be out there uh, in a week from Friday. Yeah, we're pretty fired up. I'm pretty yeah. pumped for you in this pretty wild van excursion you're about to I know. It's going to be fun. All right, so we got some questions here. Uh, what are your thoughts on traditional hand-eye drills like egg toss? Is there a way you could alter them to teach more bottom hand dominance, perhaps holding a stick with just your bottom hand uh, and to build the muscle memory that would you would do with a shooter who isn't pulling so much? Uh, how would you drill this, basically, is the question. Uh, great question. Great question. So there's a traditional goalie drill where you hold your hands without a stick like this and you step to the ball and you catch it. That's a great drill. I just have my goalies do the same thing, but catch the ball with two hands. It just teaches you to get both hands to the ball. So anytime you're using a tennis ball drill or you have your goalies face a wall and you throw the ball off of the wall and have them react to the wall, but just have them catch the ball with two hands instead of one hand. It just teaches them to get both of their hands moving in the direction of a, a ball moving in their direction. So, yeah, tennis ball drills are great. Hand-eye drills are awesome. Just use two hands when you're catching the tennis ball or the, the ball you're using. Um, it'll just really allow you to, to drill getting two hands to the ball. Another drill that I like is to warm up goalies with just their bottom hand on the stick. So have them get in their stands and then take off their top hand and make all the saves with just their bottom hand. It's just, again – Drills the fundamentals of using your bottom hand to drive the stick. Um, what about weighted goalie shafts? Any thoughts on that? Good question. We have one in the office here in Cleveland, and I have never used it. Um, I don't really know how I feel about them, to be honest. I, the, the, again, what question am I going to ask? Why? Why would we use them? Because it's heavier, and it'll get, our hand, it'll get us stronger – moving in the direction of the ball. I, I don't know if that's the case. I don't know if a, a three pound or four pound shaft is going to make our goalies that much stronger. Um, I just think it will hurt their fundamentals because the weighted shaft will, will throw off their mechanics a bit. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. I, I think I might experiment with a weighted shaft actually here um, just so I can have a better answer for the question. I, I sort of uh, kicked the can down the road a little bit here and have put off experimenting with it. I don't really know what to think about it. What do you think, Jamie? You think it makes sense? Um, I think that um, I would uh, take it to a strength and conditioning coach um, to find out, you know, where exactly weighted things, where you draw the line with weighted things helping you or not. Uh, the idea is to be explosive and quick. Um, and sometimes strengthening with heavy weights and short reps can do the trick with that. Um, for example, with shooting, you know, you're, if you really want to increase your shot speed, um, you know, you don't want to shoot uh, too much, right? Because it'll wear you out. Um, and so, but there are, there are theories on, you know, using tennis balls sometimes because you can actually shoot it harder and faster. You can swing harder and faster. Um, and so I think that it's really would come down to an expert in strength and conditioning and, and, and basically, uh, you know, um, how you develop those types of things more so than a technique to me, for me. Yeah, I agree. I don't, I don't know how I think about it. I think that's a good idea. I think that's a good idea. I, how about this? Whoever asked that question, I will experiment with the weighted shaft and I will have a better answer next time Jamie and I talk. Uh, let's see here. So uh, coach, great from Drew, Drew Dean. Coach, great stuff. How has the shot clock influenced your training? All right, so the clock to me is never important. My focus with goalies is on their breath and it's on the ball. It doesn't matter 
if it's the fourth quarter of the national championship game with 10 seconds left, it doesn't matter if it's the first quarter of our preseason scrimmage in October with 74 seconds left. I want my goalies to only be focused on the ball and to not have any thought process at all about anything else other than the ball. Your, our minds as human beings are only capable of truly focused on one thing. You can't be present and multitask at the same time. That's a quote from the very wise coach Dylan Sheridan that he shared with me that I, just, that I really love. You can't be present and multitask at the same time. So if you're thinking about the shot clock and you're letting that influence your thought process, what are you not thinking about? You're not thinking about the ball to the level that you're capable of. So I don't have my goalies thinking about the clock at all. I just want them to focus on the ball. Again, if the clock's at eight seconds, are they naturally going to be expecting a shot to come? Sure. But I want their focus to be on the ball, to approach every shot the same, and to not think about the clock or any situation like that. What about in the clearing game, though? Great point. In the clearing game, has had a big influence. The 20-second clearing clock uh, goes a lot quicker than I thought it would from a feel perspective. Um, like, you get the ball from the end line or a shot save, and that, that – 20 seconds starts going and it, it really moves. So this goes back to the athletic piece I talked about in the very beginning. Goalies have to be able to have good stick skills and they have to be able to run, run by somebody should they have to because clearing has just increased its clip. It, it, it goes way quicker now. Um, I think it's good for the sport, uh, truthfully. I think the shot clock's the best thing to happen in the sport of lacrosse in a long time. It's, uh, it's really exciting to watch. It's great for, uh, from a fan experience. Um, but it does make the clear uh, much quicker the clock has had a big effect on our goalies. Um, far more turnovers than we would like at this stage, um, but we're drilling it and we're going to continue to improve. I got a question. What, what, uh, what kind of arc do you uh, prescribe? Do you like a bigger arc, flatter arc? Do you ever step out to, to outside shooters? When you look at Dylan Ward from last summer, do you look at him and say, wow, that, that's pretty interesting because people, he, he basically has had, had, had a pretty darn big summer um, of playing an arc that most people, uh, you know, don't uh, subscribe to, to the, to the extent that I think sometimes if, if, if somebody watched him play as a senior in high school, they might not recruit him because of his big arc, and yet it works. So any thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, as a, as a young goalie, I still consider myself young, I guess, but as a young goalie, I mean, like – Dylan Ward, you, I idolize that dude, man. Like, he's unbelievable. Unbelievable. I think it goes back to what I mentioned earlier. As long as you keep the ball out of the goal, it doesn't really matter how you do. Um, I spent a lot of time in Israel. I actually lived there for a full year after I graduated college, and I got the chance to watch him play. Uh, I was sitting field level, and I got a chance to watch him make 24 saves against the Iroquois, I believe. Um, I mean, that dude is that dude is out of control. Um, the high arc, I am not going to tell Dylan Ward not to play a high arc. Um, but I am going to tell goalies that I train to play a five-step arc that is neutral. I don't want a flat arc. I don't want a high arc. I just want you to be completely calm, be completely relaxed in a neutral position, trust your instincts, trust your hip flexibility, and make saves. I do think there is value to a higher arc. Um, on inside shots because there's less goal to shoot at. When you play a higher arc on some of the farther outside shots, you're going to get burned on those top corners at this level because you're not going to have enough uh, time or room to react to the top corners. So I do worry about that from an uh, outside shot arc. I always think the whole arc and all that stuff is a big, you know, question that I've always always asked why because there was a, a line of thinking that you know flat, flat, flat heels on the back line, all that kind of stuff on the end on the goal line. Um, but uh, you know, when you look at the angles, you know, I can tell you as a shooter, if I can if I can see net, I feel like I'm going to be able to beat it beat you there if I'm within my range. And if I can't see net, now I have to shoot. And, 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 um, and move you out of the way and trust that I can do that. And it's just a different mentality. And so that's why I was asking. Yeah, but I want to take that questioning, that line of questioning one step further, Jamie. So you're playing a high arc from an outside shot at 15 yards, okay? Mm -hmm. What happens next? What happens when they pass the ball down to the alley? What happens when they dodge and the ball swings to GLE? You then have to recover that distance that you lost and you have to scramble to get back to the pipe. So if you're playing a high arc and they throw the ball to X quickly and bang it around, you have to recover all the way back. And then if they throw a skip pass up top to another 14 yards, you then have to reapproach at a higher arc 
your feet might not be set and then you're never going to make a save. So again, continue to ask those difficult questions. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I don't think it's like you play a high arc, you know, all the time. I think that what you do is when you see someone's going to shoot the ball, instead of giving them net to see, kind of like what Dylan Ward does. I mean, he doesn't play a high arc the entire time. He steps out when you're about to shoot the ball. Yeah, he really, chall- he really challenges shooters. I also think he benefits from his, uh, his physical frame. Yeah. Uh, I'm, five, I'm five foot nine, 155 pounds. So no matter how high of an arc I play, I'm, I'm never going to look like I'm taking up that much cage. Um, he has a much larger frame than I do. So yeah. when he does approach shooters in that manner, I mean, there is like literally nothing to shoot at. It's, it's pretty remarkable how it he is. Does. No doubt. And he's susceptible to the shots you're talking about, too. I mean, you know, the fact is, is that, you know, he does get beat on some, you know, high corner shots and leaners would probably go. Uh, but again, it's a it's, it's a different look. I mean, I think it's just a smart thing to have in your repertoire, honestly. I mean, like, why give people like time and room from a wing, you know, when they can see all the net in the world, they'll probably score. Um, all right, so well, one of your buddies from Slovenia, Hedge Ted. Hello from Slovenia. Yeah. First of all, thanks for everything. Secondly, how to prepare the goalies in leagues where the shots are not so predictive and the ball goes in all directions. A lot of our goalies end up injured or scared of defending. See you in Euro again, coach. And that's from uh, Daco. Oh, those are my boys. Those are my boys over there in Slovenia. So happy to hear they're tuning in. I had a great experience with them coaching in the 2016 European Championships in uh, – Good little Hungary. It's a suburb outside of Budapest. Uh, we had an amazing experience together. All right, fellas. So to answer your questions, I don't want you to be guessing. So it shouldn't matter where the ball ends up. I don't want you to guess where it's going. I want you to stay calm in the goal and then react. So there should be no confusion or, oh, that shot didn't go where it was supposed to because the ball isn't supposed to go anywhere. I want you to stay calm and then react to the ball when you do see it. With response to the game, getting hurt, there's this, there's this thing, there's this thing, and I don't support that at all. I think it diverts a lot of kids away from the position. Uh, it's something that I'm working on actually. I'm working on a product here that I'm hoping to get done soon. That is uh, like a, it's a comprehensive goalie padding for legs that really? actually that actually works, and you can actually wear. And it doesn't limit your athleticism or your mobility, but it's productive and it protects you. As I said, getting hurt with a lacrosse ball really, really hurts. There is nothing wrong with wearing leg pads to protect yourself, with wearing thigh pads to protect yourself so that you can be calm in the goal, you can relax, and you can react to the ball as opposed to guessing to where they should be going. Um, And I just want to finish there with Slovenia, guys. Keep working hard over there. I know you guys are putting in the work. I see the posts on Facebook. I'm so proud of you with all that you do, and I'll see you soon. <laughs> all right, we got a couple more questions, and we'll wrap it up. Um, are you doing any work for the goalies as it relates for defending the dive? Um, the, yeah, the dive is interesting here. Um, I'm teaching my goalies to attack the head of the stick. It doesn't matter where the dive the diver is going. It doesn't matter where his body is. It doesn't matter where his hips are or where his shoulder pads are. The ball eventually has to come out of the stick. That's where the ball comes out of. So I'm teaching my goalies to attack the diver's stick, not their body, not their arms. I don't need to see you blow up an attackman at the crease and get hurt. I want to see you attack the head of their stick. It's an awkward step because you're used to approaching the shooter. When they're diving, you're going to end up stepping about 12 to 18 inches to the left or to the right of an attackman. You're going to be stepping towards air. But the idea is that you're approaching where that head of the stick is going to be releasing the ball from, not from where the diver's body is. Awesome. All right, last question. Um, All the focus on breath is great, um, but what about the element of directing your defense and communication during the course of playing goalie on a defensive possession? This is an awesome, awesome question. And this is actually a discussion I had briefly with um, head coach John Galloway at the IMLCA Coaches Convention in Baltimore. It's a conversation I hope to continue with him at some point. We actually got cut short. So here's my thought process on the communication piece. It is a goaltender's job to make sure his defensemen are communicating. It is not a goaltender's job to be instructing the defense where to go. It is the defenseman's job to crush their role, do their job, do your role, defenseman, 
communicate through picks. Communicate who's hot. Communicate who's too. If that's not occurring, then it's the goalie's job to say, defenseman, talk, let's go, communicate, fellas. But, but it is not the goaltender's job to be talking their defense through how to play defense. Because, Jamie, if the goaltender is focused on setting his defense up, what is he not focused on? The ball. I want goalies always focused on the ball. Communication on the defensive end of the field is paramount. It is everything. If you're not communicating well on defense, you're not going to win any, any games. Defensemen have to communicate, but that is their job, and the defensemen have to be held accountable for doing their job, which is communicating. Goalies, hold your defensemen accountable. Make sure they communicate, but it is not your job to communicate them through an entire possession. You guys got to focus on the ball. I think it's a great point, um, and I know that not everybody believes that, but, but, um, but I think that it, it's true. It's really hard to multitask and focus on something at the same time. And if you're trying to focus on everything else that's going on, there's no way you're going to be as focused on saving the ball. Now, sometimes it may happen that, you know, no one's saying something and you got to say it, and you're going to, right? But it's, it's, it's suboptimal. So, um, hey, Ted, this has been absolutely fantastic. Um, I was really excited for this, and, um, and it was even greater than what I expected, and I expected a great presentation. So best of luck to the Vikings. I'll see you, uh, I'll see you a week from Friday. Tell Coach Sheridan I say what's up, and uh, thanks again for your time and your efforts on this. It was fantastic. Yeah, I appreciate it. I just want to give a quick shout-out and thank you to uh, Coach Dylan Sheridan, um, Andy German, and Matt Bertrams. They're the coaches I work with here at Cleveland State, and uh, they've gone out of their way to be kind and welcoming to me and to give me just tremendous opportunities. And I can't, I can't thank them enough for everything that they do uh, for me as a man and as a young coach. And Jamie, thank you so much as an individual for what you've been able to do for the growth of the game. As I hope I've gotten to show you a little bit today, uh, your impact is, is officially global. It's been worldwide. So never wow. lose sight, never lose sight of the big picture here. We're all, we're all striving to grow this game on the grassroots level all over the world so that when our grandkids and their grandkids are the ones on this earth that lacrosse will be, will, will be a global entity. Amen. Have All a right, good one. Bye-bye. Okay.